From around the globe, it's theCUBE. With coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Yubis Kyle. Welcome to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2020. So I'm joined today by Matt Kixmiller. He's VP of Strategy at Pure Storage, as well as Michael Ferenci. He's the Senior Director of Product Marketing uh, at Portworx, now uh, acquired by, uh, by Pure Storage. Fellas, welcome to uh, to the show. Thank um, you. Thank you. I want to start out with you know the um, kind of the lay of the land of storage in in the the cloud native space in the Kubernetes space. What's you know what's hot? What's happening? What are the trends that you see um, uh, going on? Um, Matt, if you could shed some light on that for me. Yeah, I think, you know, from a pure point of view, obviously we just saw customers really maturing their Kubernetes deployments and particularly leaning towards persistent, you know, applications. And so, uh, you know, we uh, noticed within our customer base that there was quite a lot of deployments of uh, port works on pure storage. And that inspired us to start talking to one another, um, you know, almost six plus months ago that eventually ended in us uh, bringing the two companies together. So it's been a a great journey uh, from the pure point of view, bringing Portworx into the pure family. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're uh, working through now with our joint customers, integration strategies, and uh, how to really broaden the use of the technology. So it's quite exciting times for us. And of course, it's it's good to hear that the match goes beyond just uh, the marketing color, like the brand color. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, we, we do it now. The, yeah. That, that, yeah, I mean, the fact that both companies were orange and, you know, their logo looked like kind of a folded up version of ours just uh, started things off on the right foot. A match made in heaven, heaven, right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the acquisition, uh, what's happened there, and especially, you know, looking at Portworx as a company and as, as a product set, uh, it, it's fairly popular in the cloud, com cloud community, a uh, lot, um, lot of traction with customers. So I want to zoom in on the acquisition itself and, and kind of the roadmap going forward, merging the two companies and, and adding Portworks to the pure portfolio. Matt, if you could shed some light on that as well. Yeah, why don't I start and then Michael could jump in as well. So, you know, we at Pure had been uh, really working for years now to outfit our all flash storage arrays for the container use case and ship the piece of software that we called PSO that was really a, uh, a super CSI driver that allowed us to do intelligent placement of you know, persistent volumes on pure arrays. But the more time we spent in the market, the more we just started to engage with customers and realized that there were a whole number of use cases that didn't really want a hardware-based solution. You know, They either wanted to run completely in the cloud, hybrid between on-prem and cloud and leverage bare metal hardware, and so, you know, we came to the conclusion that, you know, first off, um, although positioning our arrays for the market was the right thing to do, um, we wouldn't really be able to serve the broader need for storage mm -hmm. solutions for containers if we did that. And then, you know, the second thing I think was that we heard from customers that they wanted a much richer data management stack. You know, it's not just about providing the persistent volume for the container, but, you know, all the capabilities around snapshotting and replication and mobilization and mobility between on-prem and cloud um, were necessary. And so, you know, Portworx really brought to bear not only a software-based solution into our portfolio, um, but really that full data management stack, that platform, uh, in addition to just storage. And so as we, we look to integrate our product lines, um, you know, we're looking to deliver a consistent experience for, for data management for Kubernetes. Um, whatever infrastructure a customer might choose, whether they want to run on all flash arrays, white box servers, bare metal, uh, on VMs uh, or on cloud uh, storage as well. You know, all of that can have a consistent experience with the Portworx platform. Yeah, because you know, data management, especially in in this world of containers, is you know, it, it, it's a little more difficult. It's it's definitely more fragmented across you know multiple clouds, multiple cloud vendors, multiple cloud services, multiple instances of a service. So the fragmentation has has you know given IT departments quite the headache in, in operationally managing all that. So Michael, what's, you know, what's kind of the use case for Port Portworx in this fragmented cloud storage space? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. You know, the, the use cases are many and varied, um, you know, to put it in a little bit of a historical perspective, um, you know, I've been uh, attending KubeCons either <coughs> in person or virtual for about five or six years now, kind of losing count. And we're, we, we really started seeing Kubernetes as 
kind of a, an agile way to run uh, CI CD environments and other test dev environments. Um, and there were just a handful of customers that were really running production workloads at the very, very beginning. Um, if you fast forward to today, um, Kubernetes is being used to tackle some of the biggest central board level problems that enterprises face uh, because they need that scale and they need that agility. So, um, you know, COVID's accelerated that. So we see customers, um, say, in the retail space who are having to cope with a massive increase in traffic on their website, people searching for kind of, you know, the, the products that they can't find anywhere else. Are they available? Can I buy them online? And so they're re-architecting those web services to use um, often open source databases, in this case, Elasticsearch, in order to create uh, great user experiences. And they're managing that across clouds and across environments using Kubernetes. Um, another customer that I would say, kind of a very different use case, but also one that matches that scale uh, would be uh, Esri, which unfortunately, um, the, the circumstances of becoming a household name are a lot of the uh, COVID tracking um, ArcGIS system um, to keep track of uh, tracing and, and outbreaks. Um, they're running uh, that service in the cloud um, using Portworks. And again, it's all about how do we reliably and agilely um, deploy applications that are always available and create that experience that our customers um, need. And so we see kind of, you know, uh, financial services doing similar things, um, uh, healthcare, um, pharmaceutical doing similar things. Again, the theme is it's the biggest business problems that we're using now, not just the kind of the, the low hanging fruit as we used to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, storage is it, it, a lot of the times it's it's kind of a boilerplate functionality. It's, you know, it's, it's there, it works. And if it doesn't, you know, um, the, the, the problem with storage in, um, in in the cloud native space is that fragmentation, right? Is that that enormous, you know, on the one hand, that enormous scale, on the other hand, the, the tons of different services that can hold data that need protecting uh, as well as, as data management. Um, so I, I wanna zoom in on a, a recent development in the Portworks portfolio where uh, the, the PX backup product has spun out into its own, uh, it, its own little product. What's the, you know, what's the, the strategy there, uh, Michael? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, fundamentally data protection needs to change in a Kubernetes context. Um, the, the way in which we protected applications in the past was very closely related to the way in which we protected servers because we would run one app per server. So if we, if we protected the server, we, our application was protected. Uh, Kubernetes breaks that model now an individual application is made up of dozens or hundreds of components that are spread across multiple servers. And you have, um, you have container images, you have uh, configuration, I mean, you have data. And it's very difficult for any one person to understand where any of that is in the cluster at any given moment. And so you need to leverage automation and the ability for Kubernetes to understand where a particular set of components is deployed and use that Kubernetes native functionality to take what we call application aware backups. So what PX Backup provides is data protection engineered from the ground up for this new um, application delivery model that we see within Kubernetes. So um, unlike uh, traditional um, backup and recovery solutions that were very machine focused, um, we can allow a team to back up a single application within their Kubernetes cluster um, all of the applications in a namespace um, or the entire Kubernetes cluster um, all at once and do so in a self-service manner where integrated with your corporate identity systems, individuals can be responsible for protecting their own application. So we marry kind of a couple of really important concepts. One is kind of the, the, um, the application specific nature of Kubernetes, um, uh, the self-service desire of DevOps teams, um, as well as with a pay-as-you-go model, where you can have this flexible consumption model, where as you grow, you can pay more. You don't have to do an upfront payment in order to protect your Kubernetes uh, applications. Yeah, I think I think one key thing that Michael hit on was just the, how this application is designed to fit like a glove with the Kubernetes admin. Um, I see a lot of parallels to what happened over a decade ago in the VMware space when you know, VMware came about, it needed to be backed up differently. And a little company called Veeam built a tool that was purpose-built for it. 
And it just had a really warm embrace by the VMware community because it really felt like it was built for them, not some legacy enterprise backup application that was forced fit into this new use case. And you know, we think that the opportunity is very similar around Kubernetes backup, and perhaps the difference of the environment is even more profound than on the VMware side, where you know the Kubernetes admin really wants something that fits in their operational model, deploys within the cluster itself, backs up to object storage, is just perfect purpose built for this use case. And so we see a, a huge opportunity for that. Uh, and we believe that for a lot of customers, this might be the easiest place for them to start trying the Portworx portfolio. You know, you've got an existing Kubernetes cluster. Uh, download this, give it a shot. It'll work on any infrastructure that you've got going with Kubernetes today. And especially because, you know, look, looking at the, the the kind of breakdown of Kubernetes in the way uh, data um, is, you know, the, the infrastructure is provisioned, uh, data is is placed in, in cloud services. It's no longer the cluster admin necessarily that gets to decide where data goes, what application has access to it. You know, that's in, in the hands of the developers. Um, and that's a pretty big shift. You know, it, it used to be the VI admin, the virtualization admin that did that, uh, had control over where data was living, where data was accessed, how it was accessed. But now we see developers kind of taking control over their infrastructure resources. They get to decide where it runs, how it runs, what services to use, what applications to tie it into. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, how, how port works and, and PX backup kind of help the developer um, stay in control and, and still have that freedom of choice. Yeah, we, we think of it in terms of um, data services. So I, I, have, I have a database um, and I need it to be highly available. I need it to be um, uh, uh, encrypted, uh, backed up. I might need a DR, um, uh, an offsite DR schedule. And with Portworx, you can think about adding these services, HA, security, backup, um, uh, capacity management as really just, I want to check a box and now I have this service available. My database is now highly available. It's backed up, it's encrypted. I can migrate it. I can attach a, um, a, a backup schedule to it. So in, cause within a Kubernetes cluster, some apps are going to need that entire menu of services. And some apps might not need any of those services uh, because we're only in test dev phage. Everything is multiplexed into a single cluster. And so being able to turn off and turn on these various data services is how we empower a developer, a DevOps team to take an application all the way from test dev into production without having to really change anything about their Kubernetes deployments besides you know, a flag within their YAML file. Makes it really, really easy to get the, the performance and the security and the availability that we were used to with VM-based applications via that, that admin now within Kubernetes. So Matt, I want to spend the last couple of minutes um, talking about the, the bigger picture, right? We've talked about Portworx, PX backup. Uh, I, I want to take take a look at the broader storage picture of cloud native um, and, and kind of look at, at the, the pure angle um, on the trends and what you see happening in uh, in this space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so a couple high level things I would you know kind of talk about. You know, the first is that. Uh, I think you know hybrid cloud deployments are the de facto now, and so when people are picking storage, whether they be you know storage for a traditional database application or a next gen application, cloud native application, the thought from the beginning is how do I architect for hybrid? And so you know within the pure portfolio, we've really thought about how we build solutions that work with cloud native apps like Portworx, but also traditional applications. And our cloud block store allows um, you know those to be mobilized to the cloud without with minimal rearchitecture. Um, another big trend that, that we see is the growth of object storage. And you know, if you look at the first generation of object storage, uh, object storage is what, 15 plus years old, and many of the first deployments were characterized by really low cost, low performance, kind of the, uh, the last retention layer, if you will, for unimportant content. Um, but then this web application thing happened, and people started to build web apps that used uh, object storage as their, their primary storage. And so now as people try to bring those cloud native applications on-prem and build them in a multi-cloud way, there's a real growth and a need for uh, high performance kind of application centric object storage. And so we see this real change to the needs and requirements on the object storage landscape. And it's one that in particular, we're trying to serve with our Flashblade product that provides a unified file and object access because many of those applications are kind of graduating from file and moving towards object, but they can't do that overnight. 
And so being able to provide a, a high performance way to deliver unstructured data, whether the app wants object file or both is, uh, is very strategic right now. Well, that, that's insightful. Thanks. Um, so I, I want to thank you both for, for being here. Um, and, um, you know, I look forward to, to hearing about Portworx and Pure in, in the future as this acquisition, uh, you know, it integrates and, and new products and new developments come out from the Pure side. So thanks both for, uh, for being here. And thank you uh, at home for, uh, for watching. Uh, I'm Yupis Kach. Thanks for uh, watching the, uh, the Cube's coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2020. Thanks. Thanks, you. Yeah, thank you.